In this lab, the front end is stripping away the transfer encoding header during the rewrite to HTTP 1.1 to talk to the back end, but we can inject the transfer encoding header into one of the other request headers by preceding it with a character turn line feed, because the front end isn't stripping those away. And that allows us to turn this into a H2TE vulnerability, where we also use the application's search feature to capture the requests of our victim and seal their session cookie. Let's get started. I'm on the homepage of the lab here, and the first thing we want to do is detect and confirm the vulnerability. So I'm going to switch to burp and go to proxy and HTTP history and grab the get slash request for the root here and send it to repeater and switch to repeater. So I'm going to switch this to a post request by changing the request method. And then I'm going to delete unnecessary headers. So anything up from content type and underneath the host header. I'm also going to show non-printable characters just to show the carriage return line feeds. It's always handy for request smuggling. And then I'm going to turn off uh, update content length automatically because we want to be able to control that ourselves. And then here in the request headers, I'm going to remove the content length header because this is because we're using um, HTTP2. If I send this request, it says HTTP 1.1 now, but you'll see if I send it, it will actually just uh, convert it to Burp will detect that the front end supports HTTP2 and will um, convert to HTTP2. So I'm going to remove the content length header because uh, HTTP2 has a built-in mechanism to determine length, and we're hoping that that's what the front end is using. But then for the back end, what we're hoping for is that if we specify this transfer encoding chunk header, that the front end, when it converts our HTTP2 request to HTTP 1.1 to talk to the back end, that it will actually copy over this transfer encoding chunk header uh, in the HTTP 1.1 request to the back end. The back end then, if it follows the RFC, it will actually see this transfer encoding chunk header and it will prefer it because that's following the RFC. You should always uh, prefer transfer encoding chunk over content length if both are present. Um, so let's test that. If we send the terminating chunk as well, then we can start our um, prefix here. So what we poison the backend with, and we're going to do a get request for a resource that doesn't exist using HTTP 1.1. And I'm adding an X ignore header for a value of X, but not followed by a new line because we want um, the normal request that we're sending to be appended straight after the X here. And then I'm going to go up here and rename this tab to attack request. There we go. And then I'm going to go to proxy, HP history again, and send a second copy of this get slash request to repeater. And that'll become our normal request. We're just going to send this to make sure that we get a 200. Okay. And we do. So back to the attack request. So we're going to send this and then send the normal request. And we should be getting a 404, but we're getting a 200. So that's a sign that our attack isn't working as is. So I'm going to send this attack request again and send the normal request. It's still a 200. Let's try one more time. And we still get a 200 while we would be expecting a 404 if the uh, smuggling was uh, successful because of this uh, get request for a resource that doesn't exist. So that likely means that the front end server, when it sees or when it rewrites the HTTP2 request to HTTP 1.1, it's actually stripping away this transfer encoding chunk header. So we need to find another way to smuggle in that transfer encoding chunk header. So what we can do instead is remove this transfer encoding chunk header. And then I'm going to go to the inspector window here and dock it to the left instead. So it's a bit easier to follow. And to smuggle in the transfer encoding header, what we can do is we can go to the request headers here and add a new one. And I'm just going to add one with a name of foo for a value of bar. And then with shift enter, we can uh, insert a carriage return line feed. And what we're hoping for is that if we add the transfer encoding chunk header here now, what we're hoping for is that when the front end receives our request using HTTP2, it will actually um, not interpret the carriage return line feeds or try to strip them out. It will just convert the request into an HTTP 1.1 request. And HTTP 1.1, if this carriage return line feed isn't stripped out, it will actually see um, this transfer encoding chunk bit as the start of a new header because of the preceding carriage return line feed that we've injected. So let's add this. Uh, you can also see that the request is now cathode and we can't actually see the request headers anymore. That's completely normal. It's just because we've implemented or injected a carriage return line feed in one of the header values and burp can't really or doesn't really know how to represent that in this window. So that looks good. Let's send this request. We get a 200 OK. Send the normal request. We get a 200 OK again. That might be because of the um, lab user in the background browsing the site. So let's try this again. I'm going to send the attack request and send the normal request. Uh, yep, and we get a 404 not found. So the lab user is browsing the site every 15 seconds. So it might have eaten up that uh, prefix that we poisoned the backend with. So that confirms that our attack is working. 
Uh, so now we just have to uh, figure out how to exploit it. So if we switch back to the lab, we can see that there's a search to blog functionality here. So if I search for uh, Yarno, we can see that we have our recent searches uh, showing up for us here, and it's likely tied to our session cookie as well. So if I switch back to Burp and go to proxy and HTTP history, and just grab this post request here and send it to repeater and switch to repeater. So we can see our search for uh, the term Yarno here. Let's just send it just to make sure that that works. I'm also going to downgrade it to HTTP 1.1, uh, just to make sure that that works as well. Because once we use it for request smuggling, we do want to make sure that we're using HTTP 1.1 too. So yeah, it works. Um, next thing I want to do is it's not absolutely necessary, but I want to remove headers that uh, aren't absolutely required just to keep it a bit shorter in the, the request smuggling phase. So let's see here, we don't need any of these headers, I would like to keep content type. And then I want to keep content length as well. That's why we need to use HTTP 1.1. Because when we're smuggling, we want to be able to control that ourselves and HTTP 2 would use a built in mechanism. And then we don't need that lab analytics cookie. We do need the session cookie, otherwise, we won't be able to see the recent searches here. And then we also want to keep the uh, HTTP host header. So let's see if this works, I'm going to send this. Yep, and that we still get a 200. Okay. And we still get um, search results for Yarno. Perfect. So I'm going to go ahead and select everything here and copy it and then go back to our attack request. And instead of the get request for the resource that doesn't exist, I'm just going to paste our uh, request to the search endpoint instead. The only thing we want to think about is the content length here. So content length 12 is definitely not enough because that's just enough for the content that we have here, content length 12. But we want to make sure that when we send our attack request and follow it up with another request or a normal request, or um, when our victim sends a request, we want to be sure that we capture as much as possible of the uh, victim's request so that the session cookie, which is present in one of the request headers, will be visible on uh, this page right here. So for an initial value, let's go to proxy and HTTP history. And for the get request to the root endpoint, uh, you can see here, we have a cookie set here, that might be a good representation of what a um, normal sized request would look like. So if I select everything, and go to the right side, you can see 1049 here, and decimal size for content length. So let's start with a value of 1000. And I'm actually going to send this request to repeater as well, because it's quite a chunky request. Uh, and we want to make sure that our request here is actually bigger than the content length that we set in our attack request. So we're going to start with a 1000. And then I'm going to send this request, get back a 200. Okay, and then go to our chunky get request here, and send it as well. And we get back a 200. Okay. So now if we switch to the lab and actually go back to the home page, we can see our request here. So and we can actually see that yep, our session cookie is being leaked. So this is likely uh, sufficient to leak the session cookie of our victim as well. So let's give that a go. So what we'll do is we'll go back to burp. And then we know from the lab description that the lab user or our victim is browsing the site every 15 seconds. So I'm just going to send this attack request, and then start a timer for 15 seconds and just wait until the time is up. And then we'll check the home page again just to see if we were able to capture our victim's request. So another five seconds, more or less. Yep, that should be enough. So I'm going to switch back to the lab and go back to the home page. We got invalid requests, let's refresh the page. And we can see a request here. And it's coming from our victim. So you can see that here in the user agent. And we have a session cookie set here. So let's copy that session cookie. And then I'm going to go to the cookie editor extension under session, and just paste this, make sure I remove the semicolon, and then save this, and refresh the page. And there we go, we're logged in as Carlos, and we've solved the lab. I hope this was helpful to you. And thank you for watching.